welcome to our SOFA session on how to achieve excellence in last mile delivery. I'm Bill McBeth. I'm Chief Research Officer here at Chainlink Research. You're also going to be hearing today from Jorge Lopera, who's the Vice President and Global Head of Strategy for FARI. And our agenda today, we're going to talk about why last mile delivery has become increasingly critical for the success of retailers as well as manufacturers and distributors and really anyone who's selling physical products that need to be delivered to the end customer. The bulk of the time we're gonna spend on the three pillars describing like how to improve last mile deliver by perfecting your customer's experience, improving the efficiency and flexibility of logistics operations and how to use those improvements to grow the bottom line. And then we're gonna end up with some tips on how to get started and how to maintain momentum. It's gonna start us off discussing what is driving the intensified interest in last mile delivery. Thanks, Bill. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. So I think I'm gonna open up with probably the most obvious uh, point here, and, and many of us know it because we experience it each and every day, is that basically anything that can be ordered can be delivered. Um, we have seen in a very tremendous growth in e-commerce, um, you know, as, as you guys all are well aware, uh, we're, it looks like we're approaching about five trillion in e-commerce sales uh, by the end of this year with the expectation that that will double um, by the end of the decade. Uh, we have seen um, really growth in segments of, of uh, retail that we ordinarily would not expect, um, you know, things like furniture, um, has become really a growing segment in e-commerce and, and things as easy as uh, as food and beverage. Obviously, with the pandemic, it's really shifted, um, you know, the way that people purchase and, and really some of those habits have really stuck with it. Um, and so between that and, and really growth segments such as auto parts and even pet food, um, you're really beginning to see a lot of a lot of commerce happening online. And it's now really just a, a matter of convenience, accessibility. Um, and so those are the things that we're going to talk a little bit about as we go through the presentation is really, you know, how we're how we're able to adjust and adapt to to some of the the really the consumer preference changes that we're seeing today in the market and, and ones that will continue to go as uh, and grow as we, we move on. Um, next slide, Bill. So one of the things that, you know, we really have to begin to manage um, is, is really the complexities of, of really delivering from a point A, which could be a distribution center, a dark store, um, a brick and mortar retail location, um, working across really what is a fragmented um, option space of different methods of delivery, um, all the way out down to your destination, um, which could be your home, your business, a pickup point, a parcel shop, uh, even your neighbor. Um, we have begun to see a high degree of adoption in omni-channel fulfillment strategies um, with, uh, with about 60% of retailers um, really looking to or already implementing a ship from store model. Um, a great example of this is Target, who, who nowadays uh, really fulfills over 90% of their e-commerce orders uh, from their brick and mortar location. So they have got completely shifted away from a distribution center model and start really looking at servicing their, their customers at down to that local neighborhood level. Um, there's also, you know, really growing adoption in, in concepts such as micro fulfillment, um, you know, dark stores, pop-up fulfillment. Uh, we've, we've noticed over 25% of retailers uh, surveyed are now looking at adopting these types of strategies. And, and really all of that is a byproduct of two things. Um, you know, first of all is data. Um, retailers are now beginning to really begin to use their data to better understand consumer preferences, what SKUs they're buying, and really anticipating the sale so with that knowledge, you can now start to strategically put inventory much closer to the consumer, which obviously will improve the customer experience, allows a growing option space of, of really when and how your delivery is being made. And what's most important for the retailer outside of customer satisfaction and loyalty, it's really a cost game. With 53% of uh, total logistics costs coming from the final mile, uh, being able to get closer um, and having a higher uh, propensity of your packages being delivered, you know, within a three to five mile radius really helps shave off costs, which improves margin and really allows 
um, retailers to stay competitive in, in what is right now a really challenging times as what we're, we're, we're currently experiencing with higher inflation and, and really costs, um, you know, becoming um, a, a much bigger byproduct and an influencer of, uh, of purchasing today. Um, the the next slide, Bill, really um, talks about you know delivery being what we consider a competitive advantage. Um, we certainly these statistics really support the fact that you know a lot of what happens at cart um, is 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 really only the first step of getting um, a consumer to hit purchase, and really a lot of that stems from you know having the right option space. So typically consumers want two to three different options uh, at checkout and what they're going to actually when they want their delivery to be made whether that is uh same day next day within a time window um you know certainly having influence over your e-commerce experience um is something that you know will drive consumers to shop between point you know retailer one or retailer two um you know the the second one is is really you know around the experience themselves um when a consumer has a bad final mile experience whether you know it was a or exchange uh, between the driver and the consumer, whether they, you know, the SLA or the service commitment time wasn't met, we know that 85% of consumers are not going to shop with that retailer again. Um, it, it's obviously, um, you know, well known, right? Online gives us really the option space of of selecting what retailer we want to we want to do business with. Uh, given the fact that many many of the products that we purchase can be sourced from multiple retailers, so. Um, when it really comes down to is convenience, uh, choice, and reliability of when that e-commerce order is going to make it to your doorstep. So um, we we certainly advise many of our customers. Uh, we talk about this a lot because we really do believe that a competitive advantage is comes down to that final mile, and we strive to help our customers uh, create a really unique curated experience each and every time. As I mentioned in the prior slide, the final mile experience is the competitive advantage. And so we really break that down into to five key attributes in really achieving a superior business. Uh, the first one is around speed, um, really being able to be fast and, and be able to uh, provide an option space at checkout is, is certainly a competitive advantage and, and really what drives uh, heightened consumer satisfaction. And so um, as we discussed before, omni-channel strategies are, are really facilitating um, the ability to offer um, same-day delivery, for example. Uh, the next is affordable. And so whether you're working with third parties, whether you're using your own fleets, whether you're using a combination of the two, um, being able to keep delivery costs as low as possible um, you know, is something that you know, allows retailers to then pass those savings in a couple of different ways, whether that is through um, subsidized delivery because they're able to get their cost basis down or even free delivery itself. Um, making sure that that execution is as efficient as possible really begins to, um, you know, impact that, that overall logistics costs. Um, the next one is flexibility. Um, with different commodities now entering the e-commerce space, and so the thing I immediately think about is furniture. Um, you know, you're not going to be able to leave your a sofa on the doorstep. You're really going to have to coordinate offer delivery uh, options, be able to allow consumers to schedule. Um, and so really coordinating and orchestrating that entire experience and making it really as easy as a couple of clicks um, is something that you know keeps a lot of our, our customers competitive um, and really allows them to, um, to really encourage repeat business. Uh, reliability is it really boils down to uh, you know doing what you say and saying what you do um, and making sure you're able to meet your SLAs as promised. Um, and then lastly, which is, you know, sustainability, um, that is a topic that, you know, we are we are talking about as well quite a bit. Um, you know, many consumers are now very much more conscious in doing business with providers that do have the environment top of mind. And so some of the things that, you know, we're doing at Far Eye really are beginning to work with uh, providers that offer, you know, green fleets, um, electric vehicles. Um, so how do we interact with some of these newer options uh, that are out there? all in an effort to really drive, um, you know, really that sustainability cause. And so really, what does that equate to? Um, you know, increased future sales. Obviously, if you uh, create a, a positive consumer experience, they're going to want to shop again. Um, they're going to be uh, loyal to your brand because you're able to offer 
um, you know, green options and and be able to interact and work with uh, different fleets and and be able to really boast all of the carbon emission savings that you're able to achieve as a result of working with technology. Um, and then lastly, what does that offer is a competitive advantage. And so when you're able to educate the market on some of the things that you're able to to do um, is not just a, from a delivery option space, but also from you know a carbon emissions perspective, um, you know that really begins to set your brand apart from others. Thanks so much, Jorge, and thanks for explaining why this has become so important. And we're going to dive a little now into the to the how of how you perfect the customer's experience, how you have efficient, adaptable logistics and maximize the bottom line. So for the customer experience piece, we're gonna look at how to deliver on time, all the time, providing the customer with full visibility throughout the process, giving them choices and control over the process and dealing with returns. A key emerging strategy as Jorge laid out for shortening delivery times is stocking items in locations very close to where the consumer is and it's often referred to as hyperlocal fulfillment. So this can include things like in-store fulfillment, micro fulfillment centers, pop-up DCs to handle demand and dark stores. And a lot of retailers are using combinations of these approaches. Making this transition, it's it's no small feat. It requires investments in real estate and or modifications to your existing store layouts and processes. And some retailers and manufacturers are partnering with third parties who offer micro fulfillment center services instead of, or in addition to setting up their own hyperlocal stocking locations. And there are a handful of 3PLs that are starting to offer these kind of micro fulfillment center services. One of the big impacts of this shift to hyperlocal fulfillment is that when you distribute your inventory into these many small pockets across many locations, rather than pooling it all together at a central DC, you're going to lose the pooling effects of centralization. And as a result, it generally is going to require more inventory to achieve the same service levels. But as Jorge pointed out, people are using data and it's really important to, to implement these new ways of optimizing inventory uh, to make sure that inventory levels are not ballooning out of control and that you're having the right amount of items in the right places at the, at the right times. The reliability and consistency of your on-time delivery rates, that can be improved by implementing dynamic dispatching and routing capabilities which is the ability to change routes and plans uh, when circumstances change with traffic or delays from delivery or installation taking longer than expected or cancellations and new orders or other unexpected events like a, a road is suddenly shut down. And we know that Amazon can reroute their drivers in real time based on changing conditions on the ground and other retailers and 3PLs are implementing uh, similar capabilities. Providing transparency and visibility throughout the order and delivery process is another critical element of the customer experience. Real-time visibility into order status and expected delivery time is important for the customer, but it's also important for your own internal staff and your third-party partners. The visibility provided to your own staff is likely to be different than that you provide to the customers. So for example, a dispatcher needs a complete view of the fleet they're responsible for, or a customer service agent needs a really accurate ETA window. And for your customers, the, the minimum visibility you should strive for is this sort of standard level that parcel carriers are providing, which lets the customer know which facility their package is at or is traveling to, and when that item is out for delivery, the latest time they should expect to receive it. There is some value in going above and beyond that standard level of visibility for some kinds of deliveries where the customer must be at home, like signature required or over the threshold deliveries. And this is something that looks more like what the ride hailing, ride -hailing services like Uber and Lyft provide, where you can actually see the delivery vehicle on a map and your provider in an estimated 
arrival time window. And that window, it's generally going to become narrower and more accurate as the prior stops are completed and as the vehicle approaches. For service calls, it's helpful if you can also provide the customer some visibility into the number of jobs ahead of them in the queue and some expected variability in wait times so that the customer can better plan their day. This kind of greater level of visibility requires a much more precise ETA, and that requires integrating data from a lot of sources like updates from your DCs and transportation carriers, getting input from the GPS devices on the truck, and having software that can factor in traffic, weather, average service times, local events, and, and all these different factors. Both the customer and the retailer want the earliest possible warning when a delivery is running late. These kind of early warnings, they provide more opportunities for customers to adapt their plans, such as a manufacturing plant might alter their production sequence because the delivery of an input part or material is being delayed. Also with these kind of early warnings, the personnel at logistics service providers, they can be a lot more proactive about notifying their customers and making adjustments to their plans and routes. And some customers may also want to receive notification of, of each of the key milestones being met. So all of this, it should be configurable so that customers and the internal functions are able to receive the type and amount of data that they want in a preferred manner and medium so that they don't get overloaded, but they're still being informed as they, as they want to be. Proof of delivery, it's, it's needed for some kinds of deliveries, and this is typically some combination of a signature or photos of the packages that have been dropped off at the point of delivery. And the proof of delivery should include details like time and location of delivery, the number of packages, the order number, and potentially additional location deal if it's needed, like we dropped it off at the side door or at the front desk. When the customer knows that the package has arrived, they're more likely to bring it into the house or office sooner, and this reduces the chances of theft. Also, having images can provide some degree of evidence that packages were not damaged when they were delivered. Uh, proof of delivery system and processes, they really should be designed to minimize the amount of time and effort that drivers spend creating these documents. So for example, the system might autofill in most or all of the data. It might just tell the driver when they do or don't need to take a picture and automatically attach all of that to the order that they just delivered. It should also make it easy for customers to report damages, check on the status of return items, and generally provide feedback because making those kinds of things really convenient for the customer, it provides this valuable flow of information and feedback back to the retailer. Customers are demanding and increasingly expecting a wide range of choice and high degree of control over the delivery experience. These are some of the things Jorge touched on earlier, such as uh, I want to have things uh, delivered to the place uh, that I want to at the time I wanted to. A lot of people are working from home uh, or have some flexibility, but a lot of people still uh, it's a really big deal if they have to take a day or a half a day off to, to, to receive something. And customers, they would like to shorten the amount of time they need to be at home to receive the delivery. And some of them are actually willing to pay extra for a narrow and precise delivery window. So the, this ability for a retailer to reliably deliver at a specific hour, that's going to be a differentiator for a significant portion of the population. They also want to be able to receive the item, not just at home, but at the office or curbside pickup or at lockers. And uh, this can include delivering into a home or attached to garage when no one was at home. If you have the right technology, the driver can use a one-time electronic access key. And a few of them can even deliver to the trunk of the customer's car, wherever it's parked. Again, providing the vehicle has the appropriate technology. So this enables delivering securely to the car while the customer is at work or otherwise away from the house, and that could save them a trip back home to pick up the items. These kinds of conveniences, 
they can be actually really highly valued by today's time-starved compute consumers. There's also a growing segment of consumers, and this is uh, something that Jorge talked on as well, that they're concerned about climate change, they're looking for ways to reduce their carbon footprint, and they appreciate the ability to select green delivery slots with a lower carbon footprint. Now, one way is, of course, transitioning to electric fleet, but even if you're still using fossil fuel uh, powered fleet, uh, you can enable this by doing continuous route optimization, which is identifies the slots where a truck is going to be near that customer's location as part of a route that's already in the process of being built out using other incoming orders. That's a pretty advanced capability, but uh, if you have that, then your user interface to schedule the delivery can clearly lay out which slots are greener and potentially offer an incentive to the customer for selecting a greener slot. This is going to engage the customer more and leverage their desire to make a difference to the environment. It also results in a much more efficient and higher density route plans for the retailer, which is really helpful at lowering cost. Customers are getting more and more used to being able to order items at the last minute or change their order at any time. So a system ideally is gonna show the customer what kind of changes are still feasible at any given moment, including potentially the same day of the, on the day of delivery changes. And that requires a system that can do dynamic dispatching, routing, and rerouting as, as we touched on earlier. Now, if you do mess up and the customer's delivery expectations are not met, they usually are looking for some way to vent their frustrations. And if the retailer doesn't make it easy for them to complain and ask for a resolution directly from the retailer, then the customer is much more likely to let loose a nasty rant on social media for the whole world to see. So it's a lot more constructive if the customer can easily communicate their issue directly to the retailer or the service provider. Even if they don't have a complaint per se, they, they might have some really good ideas on how a service or product can be improved that they share with you. So whether it's a complaint or a compliment or a suggestion, to facilitate these types of communications at each step throughout the process, the customer should be presented with clear, easy opportunities to instantly provide feedback. And this is especially important at those key moments when they're most likely to be ready to provide some feedback, like just after placing an order or just after receiving the product. In fact, for some high touch services like white core delivery and in-home installation, some providers automatically serve each customer asking them about their experience. This could be via phone, text, or email as, as the customer prefers. When a retailer or service provider receives feedback of any kind, the customer should immediately acknowledge receipt of that feedback in an automated fashion, and then a real person should respond in a timely manner. This kind of human-to-human -human communication, it creates the potential for like a real dialogue to occur, and you can gain insights into what you're doing right and wrong, correct the problem immediately, and it lets the customers know that you actually care about them. This can be resource intensive, it's not free, but it can turn many potential adversaries into advocates and that, that's worth a lot. A process for digesting and incorporating this feedback into a continual improvement program is also really valuable. The expense of implementing a follow-up process like this, it, it can be high, but it ha can have a very high ROI in savings down the road through ongoing process improvements that you realize, as well as the incremental revenue and profit that you gained by securing a loyal customer. And finally, let's look at returns for the perfecting the customer experience. Jorge is gonna talk on the next couple slides here. So uh, returns are really, um you know, byproduct of e-commerce growth. Um, they, they do certainly have the highest propensity when compared to brick and mortar um, at almost a 3x clip when you when you start to look at 
Um, on average, brick and mortar returns are about about 10 to 11 percent compared to the 30 percent within e-commerce. And so certainly creating a, a, a really an easy and pleasant experience uh, throughout the returns process is critical uh, when you start to look at you know, some of the competitive advantages um, that we discussed earlier. And so, you know, certainly, um, you know, these statistics really support, you know, some of the consumer sentiment that we've been able to gather. Um, where you have, you know, nine and nine out of ten shoppers will uh, will buy again if the return is easy. Um, many people look for this, uh, you know, as part of their buying journey. And uh, with a bad experience, much like forward distribution, if it's a if it's a negative return uh, experience, then you know, more often than not, a consumer is not going to go back. And so, um, you know, w- when you really begin to look at you know how to make a returns process easy it's really you know all about the initiation experience so how easy is it to um, quickly initiate a return online whether that's through a retailer app how do you get that label um, qr code how easy is it to um, you know to to process that return and most importantly how quickly how quickly can you get that refund back and so those are really just a couple of things, um, you know, that we we begin to think about um, as part of really creating that that interface with the consumer and making that a positive one. Uh, next slide. So as I mentioned before, uh, returns they have to be free. Um, people do not like paying for returns. Um, I know myself if I'm at checkout and I know that the return actually is going to cost me money, I will 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 pass. So. Uh, certainly making it free. Uh, you know, we talked about flexibility. Um, you have to have an option space. You have to either be able to set up a pickup, easily drop it off at a, at a local UPS or FedEx store. Um, you know, really making sure that that, that process is, is really easy and, and paperless. Um, next is around visibility. Um, and really visibility is about the refund, as I mentioned earlier. Making sure that you know where your return is, um, but most importantly, when, when, is, when is the money going to be refunded? And so all of that really being done uh, quickly is is really going to be uh, what we consider the the four keys of success here. Thanks, Jorge. Of course, making returns fast, easy, and free or inexpensive can encourage more returns, which can become very expensive to the retailers and can actually become unsustainable. And as Jorge mentioned, the return rate is much higher for uh, online orders than for in-store. So avoiding the need for a return in the first place is it's much better for all involved, including the customer who's gonna be less frustrated. Each avoided return means a round trip transportation cost is avoided. The labor cost required to inspect and refurbish or repair the item is avoided. The item retains its full value because it's still new. The inventory is used more efficiently. It's not on a truck somewhere or in someone's house. And as a result, cash to cash cycle times have shorted, shortened a lot. So there's really a lot of reasons to reduce returns, but the trick is to reduce them while still making it inexpensive or free, convenient and fast for the customer if they still need to return an item. So there are a couple ways to accomplish this. First of all, the e-commerce website design, it's it really should provide a very intuitive and clear item selection process to make sure the customer understands exactly what they're ordering and then what they're ordering is exactly what they intend to buy. For apparel items, many online tools have been developed to ensure that the right size is selected, and this includes things like fit finders, interactive size guides, measurement conversion charts. We've seen videos with item-specific tips on getting the right fit, and imagery that shows different size models wearing different size clothing. So similarly, you want to pay attention to ensure the customer understands all of the most important product attributes of what they're buying, like really understanding what that color is, the type of material, its characteristics, and the care instructions. You don't want someone returning a dry clean only item just because they missed that detail before they press the buy button. There's a whole other class of items where the item must be compatible with something that the customer already owns. If it turns out to not fit or work with that system or machine that they already are using, they're gonna return it. So this includes things like car parts or computer or audio cables, protective covers for your phone or for your car or whatever. So this 
requires idiot-proof compatibility guides and selection methods. One example is uh, some auto parts websites, they'll give the customer the option of entering their vehicle's identification number. And with that number, the site can determine with confidence the exact year, make, and model of the car, which almost guarantees that the part ordered is going to be compatible with that vehicle. Along with the website design, it's important to institute a program to try to continuously reduce the number of unnecessary returns. And this could include, of course, monitoring the rate of returns, but also evaluating the reasons for and the causes of returns, and then crafting and implementing specific strategies to address those specific causes. As an example, to reduce returns due to damaged products, you could run some analytics to identify which, which particular products, which carriers, which routes, and which drivers have higher than normal rates of damage. And then you can target your efforts to make sure that they understand and institute corrective actions to reduce the damage for those products or carriers. For example, analytics might reveal that there's insufficient or improper packaging or packing practices at the distribution center that could be remedied. Drivers with unusually high damage rates can receive additional training and suppliers whose products have high defect rates or inaccurate product des descriptions can be notified and provided with the information and the incentives to fix those is issues. So yeah, incentives could be, hey, you wanna keep doing business with us, you better fix it. Uh, it's impossible to reduce returns to zeros no matter how good you get at it. So in parallel with efforts to reduce returns, retailers need to improve their own returns and reverse logistics operations. The most expensive way to do first mile reverse logistics is picking up each and every item from each customer's home. So the use of third-party drop-off points and stores for returns, that recruits the customer to provide that first mile of reverse logistic and consolidates large numbers of returns at those collection points. Also, instead of having a separate fleet for reverse logistics, it's often a lot more efficient to use the same trucks and drivers for reverse logistics that they are already doing your forward logistics to replenish stores or deliver to homes. This is going to require a systems that can coordinate your reverse logistics planning and execution with the forward logistics planning and executions. Also, analytics can be used to determine and should be used to determine the most profitable disposition decisions for each return request, whether to let the customer keep the item or redeploy or dis dispose of it at the store or transship to another store or return to the DC. And then once the item is at the DC, the decision of whether it should be refurbished, repaired or liquidated, all of those decisions can be done much more optimally using big data than uh, a person making a judgment call on the fly. So logistics is the engine that delivers the perfect customer experience that we just described, and it needs to be both efficient and flexible. And this comes from having an adaptable culture, streamlined delivery flows, flexible mode and route selection, and automation of repetitive mundane tasks. Disruptive events like the pandemic, the war in Ukraine, extreme weather events, and severe supply chain disruptions that we've been seeing over the past couple of years, these can force retailers to have to make sudden dramatic changes. And this includes drastic changes to last mile delivery. As an example, the pandemic forced many, or actually most bricks and mortar retailers to have to suddenly and massively ramp up their home delivery and their curbside pickup operations. The ability to make these kinds of big, bold pivots rapidly and successfully, it requires making a culture of agility. And this means having really good bi-directional communication so that everybody in the organization understands why these dramatic pivots or changes are needed and equally important so that the executive team 
has continuous visibility into how things are actually going on on the front lines, uh, getting feedback from the organization so they can continuously adjust the approach as needed. It also means empowering frontline workers and managers to make independent decisions as the situations on the ground change instead of them having to run every little thing up the chain of command for approval. Flexibility can be designed into processes by better anticipating what are the potential exceptions that might occur and providing the mechanisms to handle deviations when needed. The technology and the systems that underpin your last mile delivery execution, those are also gonna make a big difference in either forcing processes to be rigid and inflexible or conversely, enabling rapid adaptation when circumstances change. Having low code or no code workflows, that's an example of a flexible infrastructure that allows processes to be rapidly adjust as, as needed and supports the kind of adaptability we're talking about today. In this effort to become adaptable, it's important not to lose efficiency and streamlining delivery flows can help achieve flexibility while improving efficiency at the same time. As we move to the more of a hyper-local delivery model that we've been discussing, it's gonna shift inventory from the central or regional DC out to the local fulfillment centers. So to make the flow of inventory out to those micro fulfillment centers more efficient, implementing some type of cross docking or flow through techniques can really help to minimize the amount of time that the inventory spends in the DC. Now for some items like slow movers that stop over at the DC can be eliminated altogether by implementing dropship programs where the supplier delivers directly to your customer. The challenge with dropship programs is getting suppliers to execute and perform consistently up to your standards. And these kind of programs, they really take a lot of effort to get them right. That's effort in building your relationships and training your suppliers. And, and you really need to do rigorous monitoring of suppliers' compliance and their performance to make sure that they're maintaining your delivery standards. Direct store delivery is another way to bypass the retailer's DC by having your suppliers deliver directly to the stores and making that supplier responsible for maintaining the shelf stock. This method is used mostly for perishable high volume items, especially in grocery. Making these moves to cross stocking, drop ship, or direct store delivery, it's not easy and it requires big investments, but in some cases it's the right thing to do and that investment is going to be worth it. Warehouse management systems can also be used to help streamline last mile delivery through the automation of material handling, better pick, pack, and ship processes, and by optimizing the truck loading sequences to make sure it matches the delivery route so that the delivery drivers only have to handle each item once. Adaptable logistics also requires having flexibility to use the optimal mode of delivery and the ability to dynamically optimize routes, including potentially making changes during the day of delivery. Mode flexibility requires having the right resources and service relations set up, and this might include a mix of your own private fleet, contracts with carriers, and possibly crowdsourced delivery services. On top of all that, you need systems that are flexible enough and smart enough to select the optimum mode for each order. Some companies, or actually a lot of companies, have inflexible mode selection algorithms like deliveries within 50 miles of our DC always go on our truck and deliveries outside that 50 mile radius are gonna go on a carrier. You really need systems that are a little more intelligent and adaptable, so in an example, if the system sees that one of your private fleet trucks is gonna drive near a delivery address that just happens to be a little bit outside the 50 mile radius, it should still add that order to your own truck rather than send it via carrier. And that would save some money compared to what a rigid rule-based system would do. A more adaptive system might use your own private fleet to handle the base load of deliveries 
that you know are always going to occur every day, and then use parcel services to handle the forecasted peaks in demand, and as needed, tap into crowdsourced delivery services for unexpected or unforecasted surges. This kind of flexible mode selection can provide a higher level of service at lower operating costs with lower capital expenses. Dynamic dispatching and routing can also provide the ability to better adjust to unanticipated changing circumstances on the ground throughout the day. This is going to require systems and processes that can make changes on the fly. So for example, if one truck is behind schedule and another is ahead of schedule and the timing of their routes is going to allow it, having the ability to transfer product from one truck to another out in the field could help balance the workload and keep your deliveries on time. Now that's a, a pretty advanced or actually a very advanced practice, and it's gonna require an advanced dynamic routing system that can support those ki kinds of practices. Other examples are mixing of same day and next day delivery on the same truck, dynamically updating and optimizing routes across the network based on the changing conditions throughout the day and replanning routes and schedules whenever an installation or repair job is deviating from the original plan. Dynamic routing optimization can bring some really impressive benefits. In this example, this one company reduced the number of trucks they needed by 28% and the number of miles driven 13%. Those are really significant savings for what can be uh, really not that big investment uh, in a technology like this. We are seeing automation and AI receiving a lot of attention, and we think justifiably so. You know, mundane, redundant, and low-value tasks, they really should be automated whenever it's feasible. And AI can create quite a bit of value using the massive amount of data that we're now generating. AI can take all this data and automatically deal with many of the low priority exceptions that have simple solutions that currently consume a lot of time of skilled transportation planners. And at the same time, this AI can monitor all this data to identify and alert pl planners and dispatchers of the specific issues that are still going to require some human judgment to solve. The AI system can do the grunt work of gathering together and organizing all of this disparate information that's going to be needed by those people to make those judgment calls. And this frees up the scarce resource of skilled human planners so they can focus their time on making the most important decisions like the trade-offs and different route optimization alternatives. Dispatchers can also spend less time trying to monitor every little detail in every vehicle to try to keep on top of the entire fleet and see who's running late and then trying to figure out which of those delays matters the most and where should they should pay attention and spend their time. A well-implemented predictive AI system could instead notify the dispatcher earlier about which deliveries are going to be late and let them know which of those deliveries matter the most so the dispatcher could spend more time figuring out what to do about those most critical delays. Tools that simplify and streamline the driver's job, those are also really valuable. These tools can make the driver more productive and less prone to mistakes, and it can free up their attention and time to focus more on delivering superior customer service. So this includes things like automation of checklists for vehicle inspection, providing the best possible navigation aids, and providing site-specific instructions that can save the driver from having to wander around a big complex site trying to figure out where they're supposed to deliver. It can include error detection algorithms to ensure things like route compliance or that the correct packages are being delivered to the right locations. And now we're going to look at how all of this can come together to maximize the bottom line. Almost all of the capabilities we've been discussing can be leveraged to improve the bottom line. I'll give a few examples here. Dynamic route optimization that we just talked about, that's gonna increase your vehicle utilization and deliveries per hour 
while at the same time reducing your fuel consumption. The automated workflows, that's going to save on labor costs, and it can be used to institutionalize your best practices and reduce costly errors. Reducing returns, that decreases shipping costs, inspection and recur costs. It will reduce your markdowns and write-offs and your inventory costs. If you integrate your reverse logistics with your for forward logistics, it's going to improve your vehicle and driver loop uh, utilization, better visibility and transparency, and customer communications. These can help you to maximize your first attempt delivery rates and reduce disputes and chargebacks. And finally, you know, the ability to optimize across modes flexibly. This lowers your overall delivery costs. It reduces capital expenses by right-sizing your private fleet. And it builds surge capacity to meet peak demand without having to hire additional people or do additional capital expenses. Initiatives to continually improve driver and carrier performance can also be built using the same capabilities we've discussed today. Performance should be monitored on an ongoing basis and improvements should be driven using a scorecard with KPIs for drivers and carriers, such as on-time delivery rates, first attempt delivery rates, damage rates, and so forth. Organization-wide, regional, and individual goals for improvements should be established and regularly monitored, and progress for specific initiatives can be measured. So, for example, accident rates and fuel usage could be measured to track the impact of a driver training program. Damage and claim reduction efforts can be measured to see whether or not specific carriers and drivers are making progress on lowering their damage rates. When you make specific performance measures like this, it provides the foundation to motivate and offers incentives to meet specific milestones and improvement goals. When you pick the right metrics, and if you regularly review them with employees and partners and combine them with meaningful incentives, it, it can really go a long way to drive substantive continual improvements in your performance. So as you can see, there are so many different ways to improve last mile delivery, and it can be hard to know where and how to get started. It's great to have this big, bold, long-term vision of where you wanna go, and you should do that. But at the same time, as the proverb says, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. So when considering where to start, it's a good idea to think not only about where your biggest pain points are, but also which initiatives are most likely to be approved and will have the fastest payback. Dynamic route optimization, that's an example of a capability that can be implemented with a modest investment and it delivers rapid payback. It's also important to understand what kind of initiatives are going to get support from your executive team. If the CEO and senior executives have some hot button issue or they're pushing a set of key goals or initiatives, it never hurts to try and piggyback on those if it's possible. Now, sometimes an initiative, like let's say you're migrating all the divisions of your company onto a major new corporate-wide ERP system, that's gonna suck up all the oxygen and all the budget and IT resources in the room. In that case, finding capabilities that can be implemented with very little IT support and a modest cost might be the best place to start. So for example, low code or no code workflow automation of some simple repetitive tasks, that can be done with pretty minimal IT involvement if you pick the right system to do it. It's usually really important also to try and measure the return on your investments. This is both to justify why you should make the investment in the first place and then see if you actually got the improvements you expected once you implement. This means taking before and after measurements of the specific metrics that you think are going to be impacted by the investment you're making, and then calculating the value of the actual improvements realized and comparing that against the cost of realizing them. Once you've done that and you're seeing some positive returns and substantial returns, you can use that to justify and fund further investments, and this can start to create momentum and a positive 
snowball effect. It's also essential to leverage technology, solution providers, and service delivery partners. And this is important for retailers and manufacturers of all size. You, you know, you most likely already have some providers and partners in place, and it might be worth assessing, are these the right ones? Uh, and if you're going into some new area, uh, you definitely want to look at who's available. Spending effort up front on identifying, evaluating, and selecting the best partner for your specific needs and situation, uh, it's really important, and you'll get a return on that uh, upfront investment. Last but not least, cultivating a culture of continuous improvement is key. A corporate culture should incentivize individuals and teams to set and meet improvement goals, and it should empower them to make the decisions themselves quickly to adjust to changing circumstances. This kind of empowerment can help improve morale and retain employees by giving people a sense of purpose and respect, and the productivity improvements that you gain from a culture of improvement can also help to reduce the strain on an overstretched workforce, which is ever more critical in today's tight labor market. So putting all this together, if you can implement a series of rapid high ROI initiatives, leveraging the right partners to help you get it done, and creating a culture of continual improvement, you're bound to succeed. That concludes our session for today, and thank you so much for joining us. Take care.